Well, didn't see that one coming. Sure, it's not the highest profile game out there, but it's certainly got a strange story to it. Rumored to be one of the latest NES releases, scrapped at the 11th hour despite the translation and localization being complete, sitting on a shelf for a couple decades, a surreptitious leak online of a prototype cart leading to one of the holy grails of the early ROM scene, the game they called Earthbound Zero. Or Mother, since that's legit as well. But apparently Nintendo prefer the term Earthbound Beginnings. So when you go on the virtual console, that's what you're looking for. Was a heck of a way to kick off E3, releasing to an unsuspecting Western world the mother game they weren't exactly looking forward to. Got everyone's hopes up about the potential for a Mother 3 release, and then we got... Muppets and Star Fox. Two very cool things, but not precisely what we were expecting. So let's take a look at the game that would have been Earthbound had it happened when it should have. And don't step in the barf. Except there isn't really any barf. Or references to pants wetting, or excess flatulence, or any of the things we associate with Earthbound. We hadn't gotten there yet. And thus, we hit the first jarring difference between the two games. This NES relic looks, sounds, and kind of plays like its successor, almost identically in places, but the feel is very different. Call it limitations on what they could do with the system. Call it the treehouse not having hit their stride localization-wise. Call it the difference between 1989 RPG design and 1994 RPG design. And when you think about it, that five years saw the genre advance by leaps and bounds. Just think, the Final Fantasy series went from faceless protagonists with the beginning of a job system to suplexing trains and beating up clowns. The Breath of Fire series started, as did the Fire Emblem series, the Shining series, the Mana series, the Lunar series, and trust me, as you're slogging through this thing, you'll be wishing you were playing any of those titles. And you'll realize this the first time an ally swings into the air where an enemy used to be. Yep, JRPGs in 1989 weren't the refined beasts that they were in the 16-bit era with intricate storylines and detailed sprite art. JRPGs were basic tile sets and Spartan environments. JRPGs were obscenely high encounter rates, EXP grinding, and interrogating every townsperson in the hopes of getting a clue. JRPGs were massive maps with little direction, which, when coupled with the aforementioned encounter rate, almost had me shivering in a mass on the floor dreaming of the good times I had with Final Fantasy XIII. Wrap your head around that one. This is some brutal weep into your ecto cooler shit, as was standard back then. After settling a poltergeist attack and disturbances at your local zoo and graveyard, Psychic Kid Ninten, sound familiar, takes an extended trip through the psilocybin laced dreamscape of Magicant, sound familiar, befriends some flying men, fights some floating eyes, gets into an existential argument with no one, or rather someone claiming to be no one simply because he's standing between you and where the game demands you be. Hold on a sec. When you get right down to it, that's at the heart of the Earthbound we know and love. A contrivance standing in your way, acknowledging with a straight face that it is a contrivance. Then it's just a task of getting around it. Whether it's a nowhere man or an eraser that needs erased, the standard toolbox of tropes is left in plain view in a world designed to mirror our own as closely as possible, except where it doesn't. You don't have high fantasy and codpiece clad heroes traipsing about. You have a bunch of kids buying ridiculously expensive slingshots and spending hundreds of dollars on medication. That's not a reflection of reality, I don't know what is. Well, it gets a little fuzzy around the whole psychic powers and alternate magical dimension and cats swimming on land nonsense. Anyway, as we continue on, you see the same concepts you know, just with eight fewer bits. You befriend a nerdy kid with a fascination for bottle rockets, you invade a large factory area or two, you meet a girl with psychic powers and an eerie premonition, you come across a tough guy who prefers edged weapons to baseball bats and frying pans, and you thwart an evil plot that apparently sees you beating the hell out of hippies and rogue automobiles. You're going around trying to find eight pieces of a melody and... Yeah, I realized that they recycled pretty much all of this for Earthbound. There are little bits of difference though, but not many. The primary distinction is that the 16-bit offering has more polish that just wasn't possible or yet imagined in the first go-around.
Earthbound Beginnings is going to feel like kryptonite to anyone who grew up playing the RPGs of the 32 or even 16-bit eras. It's so customer unfriendly that Comcast's hired a dozen copies to work in tech support for them. But at the same time, I couldn't really stop playing. Perhaps it appeals to the same part of my brain that can't get enough information on dummied out or debug content in games. The part of my brain that loves seeing concept art, and how it all morphs together into a cohesive whole. After all, the graphics, up to and including the weird clay models that form the basis for most of the character design, are just like its successor. The soundtrack, besides being a masterwork in its own right, informed the equally accomplished score of the later work. Ultimately, playing this game will make you think you're playing some kind of awkward beta of Earthbound, granted one a console generation older, where you get to see what it was like before the inclusion of such poetic masterpieces as Spit Spit Spit, Saliva Spit Spit. Want some gum? Get your own twit. <laughs>